Oh, good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome you to my lecture today. Uh, before I get started, I first want to appreciate uh, those who attended my talk on Wednesday. I hope you enjoy the talk. Um, I'm going to say today is uh, going to be the final topic that you know, final lecture we're going to have, you know, what we're going to have on Monday and Wednesday is going to be revision, okay? And of course, I need you to check our uh, announcement section on Canvas. I've already uh, published uh, the guide, you know, the uh, final exam guide. You can check the areas, the final exam guide, you know, the final exam is going to cover, okay? I think I said chapter 9, 10, and 11. Okay, so uh, today's uh, topic is very, very interesting. Of course, you know, the other time we started our uh, linear models. And of course, I walk you through example of linear model. And at times we could have what I call a non-linear specification. And in the non-linear specification, um, if we're able to uh, maybe taking the log of both, you know, the log reading of the given uh, model, and if at the end of the day it can be linearized, of course, you know, we're able to use a linear approach as well. And of course, what is new today? What is new today is what is the essence of estimating parameters in a linear model? Of course, the essence of estimated parameter in a linear model, because don't forget, we are seeking to get the true relationship between the dependent and the independent. And of course, the model we specify as parameters, which we call regression parameters, you know, the beta naught, the beta one. And let me tell you this, we uh, normally conduct uh, inference, statistical inference, on these parameters, the statistical effect we conduct on the parameter, we can actually construct confidence interval about the parameters. We can also test hypotheses about it. You remember the other time when we were only focusing on, on a variable, and we, you know, when we were talking about estimators, of course, you know, we did the same. Okay, when you uh, derive an estimator, could be a um, unique or uh, minimal variance on bias estimator. Of course, you know, in addition to investigating for its property, we also construct confidence interval about it. And not only that, we test hypothesis about it, we also want to do the same uh, for linear models. Okay, so in the outline, when, when we talk about statistical inference, making inference about parameters involved, testing hypothesis about it, and constructing confidence interval about it. So today, I'm actually going to walk you through how we can test hypothesis about the linear regression parameters, and how we also how we can also construct confidence interval about it. Then, how can we also um, make an inference? on the linear function of modal parameters, okay? I'm actually gonna walk you through that as well, because uh, we, at times the linear function of parameters could be, maybe we wanna talk about prediction interval, okay? You know, we have two types of prediction interval. Uh, we may wanna talk about the individual prediction interval, or we wanna talk about average prediction interval. So the two of them for on the linear function of modal parameters. Now let's get started. Now let's first for start with the inferences concerned. You know, when you talk about linear model, we got two parameters. Like talk about simple linear regression model, we got two parameters: the beta naught and the beta one. This is the specification of the parameters. Let us assume that an engineer, okay, actually specify this. Okay, the engineer is interested in study relationship. 
between Y and X, Y here is a strength of concrete. After 28 days, the strength of concrete, after 28 days, and S is the water or cement ratio in the concrete. Of course, we all know uh, the, strength, the strength of a concrete actually depends on the water you put into it and the cement. You know that, right? Okay. Now, if in reality, okay, the strength of concrete does not change with the water cement ratio, if that doesn't happen, then it means beta one equal to zero. If I needed to do, I needed to take a look at the in the module specification now. The moment this guy equal to zero, okay. The moment that guy equal to zero, then what I what is, it means why the moment this guy equal to zero, okay. The moment that guy equal to zero, then what I what is, it means why it means the strength, okay. Of the concrete that we're talking about does not depend on that uh, particular factor. So that is what we mean when beta one equal to zero. Now, because of that, the engineer may want to test how significant is the beta one? Is the beta one significantly different from zero? Let me tell you, when you have data set now on strength of concrete and on the water cement ratio the beta one is when you compute beta one it may not be exactly zero but what we're trying to say is is the value we got significantly different from zero or it is not does that make sense okay so that is what we actually want to say so which means well, this engineer want to test hypothesis about the hypothesis is going to be under the non-hypothesis. You're going to have that under the alternative. That's what you're going to have. So the non-hypothesis here is going to say there is no significant difference between, uh, you know, there's no significant difference. Uh, you know, uh, I, I mean, that, that beta one is not significantly different from zero. Why the alternative is saying it is significantly different from zero. So, before moving forward, the non-hypothesis needs to be rejected. If the non-hypothesis is rejected, they then actually confirm the significance of the relationship between the strength of concrete after 28 days and you know, the, the, the water cement ratio. And that's exactly what we want to talk about. And that's why we said all oh, the engineer may wish to estimate the mean rate change the beta one is the mean rate change, or you say average rate change, okay? In the expected value of Y, it is not just a change in Y. In the average of Y, don't forget, the Y itself is a random variable because I, if I take a, uh, you know, a sample of concrete, I don't expect to have the same strength. There's going to be variation within them. And that is the reason why we're trying to say in expectation of why for a unit change in the water. You know, this is what happened. How do we interpret beta one? The beta one can be interpreted as okay, want to look at for when when S when when S increased by one unit. Okay. Now we want actually gonna want to see how on average the dependent variable y will respond to that. Does that make sense? That exactly. So because of that, we actually gonna we have uh, uh, a way to test this formally, and that is gonna lead us to testing hypothesis on beta one. Hypothesis on beta one, okay, is testing the significance of beta one in any in any relationship, okay, beta one need to be significant for us to be able to uh, confirm how significant okay is the relationship does that make sense now if you take a look at this at times we want to test hypothesis we may have a certain value in mind you know the other time i was saying zero right here i was actually saying zero here right 
it may not be zero at times. It could be something else. Okay, maybe before you go into this, uh, into the production, and they anticipate what the values of that beta one is going to be, and because of that, that's now become an hypothesized value. When you take a look at the non H O, it's a B I equal to bi0, could be whatever value, it's an hypothesized value. And it gives the alternative, and the alternative can take any of the three nature. It could be less than, it could be greater than, it could be not equal. To. Does that make sense? Okay, now, the next thing is, what is going to be the test statistic? Please, whenever we are testing significance of beta one, the test statistic is going to be beta one cap. You know, when you take a look at what you see here, I, I'm not going to say beta one. I think I'm just going to say beta high. Okay, where I can be zero or one, and if I equal to zero, I'm testing for the significance of intercept. If I equal to one, I'm testing for the significance of slope. Don't forget, in a simple linear regression model, you got beta naught. You got beta one. So this is like a general way. Like I put a test on beta high. Now, depending on what you are, what you are actually investigating. Now, when you take a look at the formula now, if I'm investigating uh, for beta one, so right here is going to be beta one cap, the minus the hypothesized value, divided by S. Then what you see in the square root, the CII, okay, depending on, the, the CII depends on, are you talking about, if you're talking about intercept, it's going to be C00. If you're talking about slope, it's going to be C1. It's that, that, that is going to be for the slope, okay? So the CII there could be C00. If it's going to be C00 if you are testing hypothesis on the intercept. The intercept is beta naught. You want to know how significant is beta naught. If you want to know how significant is beta 1, it's going to be that one. And don't forget, you know what SSS means. Now, let me tell you this. We need a, we need a rejection region. How do we take a decision? I need you to take a look at this. The rejection region here actually depends on the nature of the alternative. When, you, when your alternative is greater than, then you're going to reject the non-hypothesis when T is greater than T alpha. When the alternative is less than, you're going to reject the non-hypothesis when T is less than T negative alpha. When your alternative is to T test, you're going to reject the non-hypothesis when the absolute value of T is greater than T alpha over two. So what determines the rejection region is actually the nature of the alternative. Does that make sense? Is there anyone who, who want to ask question? And let me tell you this. It means I'm actually going to check T alpha uh, or T alpha over two from a T table. Uh, if I want to check from a T table, that would be under the degree of freedom of N minus two. Of course, the two there because we got two numbers of parameters. I think somebody shot with me right now. Uh, somebody said, we have, do we always use T distribution? Yes, we always use T distribution. Or do we use normal? Okay, that's a good question. Whenever you are dealing with a regression, like testing sig uh, uh, significance of regression parameter, we always use T test. Okay, uh, for those of you online, if you want to, if you want to talk, uh, I will need you to sh uh, tell me by chatting with me. Okay, then I'm going to enable you to talk in case you want to talk. Okay, for those of you watching uh, online. So I don't know if I've answered your question now, the person that chats with me about whether we always use T distribution. I need the person to say yes, if I've already explained that, I'm still waiting. For the person online. Are you are you still there? The person online? Okay, thank you. Then I just confirm that now. Okay, so any question on this? Do we have question? Okay. Go ahead.
No, the, 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 the sample size, irrespective of the sample size, the test here is T test. Because uh, we have an assumption that the distribution of the parameter is normal in the first place. So if it is normal, okay, even when you use T test, even if the sample size is increasing, T distribution behave like a normal distribution. That's a good question. So when the sample size increases, the T distribution behave like a normal. Okay, now, can we have an example of, of on this? Of course, uh, I think uh, 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 somebody share with me again. Oh, okay. Now, we've used this data set before. Okay, now when you take a look at this data set, of course, I walk you through this. We, we've been able to, we obtain uh, the, uh, the estimate of the two parameters. Okay, I, I want to believe you still understand how we go about it. You know, we got a beta uh, one cap to be this guy, and we got a beta not cap to be that. Okay, now after getting this, we may want to investigate, okay, how significant is any of this? How significant is beta naught? How significant is beta one? You, you can get whatever value, but are they significant? Okay, now, and that is the reason why here, do the data of that example, level point one, present sufficient evidence to indicate that the slope differs from zero? Because you need to first confirm whether the slope is significantly different from zero. If it is not significantly different from zero, that very model is not going to be a good model. You know, even though relationship exists, but the relationship is not significant. And that is the reason why hypothesis need to be conducted on that. Now, test using alpha equal to 0 0.05 and give bound for the attained significance level. Now, if we want to do this, if you want to answer a question like this, the very first thing is I need you to state before I first specify your, you know, uh, your hypothesis formulation, you need to be able to tell the world, what is your non-hypothesis? What is your alternative? Does that make sense? That's what you've just done now. Now, if you go back to the formula that we want to use, we're testing on the slope. This is the test statistic here. If we're testing on the slope, it means we're going to choose beta one cap. We've already computed that. Minus the beta one zero here is just going to be zero. It's an hypothesized value. And S, okay, is the standard deviation or standard error. Then we're going to use C11 here. C11. We're going to use this guy. And don't forget the SSS is a submission of x minus x bar all squared. Now I'm going to I'm going to walk you through this right now. Now, uh, we've we've got SSS to be ten based on what you've done before. Summation, you know the XSX. If I want to remind you, it is summation, okay, into x minus x bar, okay, all squared, okay? Now, that, that actually gave 10. And you know we've obtained the beta 1 cap before, right? That was that. Now, you remember, we, we in the formula, we need s. We need, uh, uh, we need, uh, give me one second. We need this guy. And if I want to get a guy, I need a sample variance. And I'm not going to use the conventional formula for sample variance, but I'm going to use an estimate of sample variance when the dependent variable is related and, uh, to independent variable. And you remember in this class, I walk you through that. The estimate of that is going to be sum of square error 
divided by m minus 2. Do you remember that? Sum of square error divided by m minus 2 is going to be the estimate of the sample variance because we're, we're actually talking about linear regression now. It's always going to be that. So I only need the sum of square error. And you know what? The sum of square error, if I want to get sum of square error, I have to come back here. Okay, you know, I need y minus y cap. Okay, first, what is your y cap? Your y cap is a beta naught cap. Okay, plus the beta one cap. Okay, so which means what I'm trying to tell you now, okay, you need to fall. You, you've already gotten your beta naught cap, beta one, uh, beta one cap. You're just going to be putting the values of x into that for you to be able to have your predicted. The moment you get predicted, then you are uh, you're going to be subtracting that from the original y. That will give you error, right? Then you square each of that. When you square each of that, then you sum that. That is sum of square error. Is there anyone in this class who doesn't understand how to obtain sum of square error from the data set? Is there anyone? Okay, you are good, right? Okay, do not hide your feelings. Now I've gotten that s squared equal to sum of square error divided by m minus two, and that gives us that. And the next thing now, I can obtain my C11. The moment I have my SSS, I'm going to get my C11. It's going to be one of that, one over that. Then I can now go into the, the test statistic now. Then I'm going to plug in the values. I'm going to plug in the values. You can see that I've plugged in the values. And I got a test statistic value of 3.65. Now, when I got a statistic, you know, 3.65, the next thing is to go to table. I need a critical score. And, you know, going to table, you need to put it to consideration. What is the nature of the alternative? If you go back a little bit, okay, if you come back here, the nature of the alternative we're dealing with is not equal. To, then, of course, we actually need, we're going to be needing that as a rejection region. Okay, now I need, I need T alpha over 2, not just T alpha, because it's the two tail. It's a two-sided test. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to go into, I'm going to go, you know, when you have alpha to be 0 0.05, alpha over 2 will be 0 0.025. Then I'm actually going to go to T table, check is under 0 0.025 at the degree of freedom 3. Why is it a degree of freedom 3? Don't forget the sample size here is 5. And the degree of freedom is n minus 2. Does that make sense? So, and in the end, I got 3.182 as the critical score. Now, the next thing now is to compare the absolute value of the test statistic with the critical score. Now, the 3.65 is greater than 3.182. So when, 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 when it is greater than 3.182, then we actually going to reject. So, and that was why I said, because the absolute value of the calculated value of T is greater than 3.182, then we, we got no choice to reject the non-hypothesis at a 0 0.05 level of significance. Let me tell you this. Whenever you are taking decision, you must indicate the level of significance. Does that make sense? So you can see that. Okay. And if I want to, another way to look at it is to compute the p value. That's a way to compute the p value. Okay. So in the exam, you may decide to compute the p value. If you don't want to compute the p value, there's no problem. You can take decision with the rejection region. Does that make sense? Okay. So any question on this? What have we done now? We've just conducted hypothesis testing about the slope beta one. We can also do the same about the beta naught. 
if you want to do the same about beta naught, you know, if you go back to the test statistic, if you go back to the test statistic, let's say what I want to test is for the beta naught. If you go back to the test statistic, the first one is going to be beta naught cap. Okay. Then your S is still going to be the same. But the only difference is just going to be CII. Yes. And don't forget what you're going to use. It's going to be this guy. Please take note of that. Okay. Now we want to move right now. Now, you know, I told you the other time when we're, when we're talking about inference, inference is about testing hypotheses and also about constructing confidence interval. So right now, I, I've already walked you through, you know, I've already walked you through how we conduct hypotheses about uh, linear regression parameters. But I also want to show you how to construct a confidence interval about it. And the question is, why are we constructing confidence interval? We're actually constructing confidence interval because we actually want to see how sample review the overall view of the population. You know, I told you the other time, uh, you know, a point estimate could be wrong or right. I'm going to say that again. Even if you have done everything you're supposed to do, a point estimate, getting a single value it could, it could be wrong or right, and it's too dicey. The, you know, according to the classical approach of probability, you know, the probability that it's going to be wrong or right is the same. And for us to be at the safer side, we needed to construct a confidence interval so that we can incorporate the margin of error. So incorporating the margin of error will give us an opportunity to define that in an interval with the associated degree of confidence. So if I want to do that, take a look at this guy. It's still going to be the same thing. It's similar to what we, the, the test statistic except that we're going to have a beta i plus or minus t alpha over 2, y, t, y alpha over 2, confidence of our is we're pursuing a two-sided one, then that S see the same standard deviation and then the square root of CII. Whether I'm going to use COO or C11 depend on what I'm constructing the confidence interval about. Does that make sense now? And of course, the COO is right here. And the C11 is right here. Is there anyone who doesn't understand how who doesn't understand this? Is there anyone? Okay, then I'm gonna move right now. Go ahead. Uh, you say what? Oh, the sum of square error. Yeah, S, S, S no, S is not sum of square error. S is an estimate of the standard deviation. And the estimate of standard deviation is actually going to be the square root of sum of square error divided by m minus 2. Does that make sense? So the S, that S is going to be square root of sum of square error divided by n minus 2. That's a good question. So S, the, the, the S here is different from sum of square error. Have I answered your question? Okay. Now, we want to go, let, let's base this on the same example. Construct a 95% confidence interval, okay, for beta 1, okay? You know, we've calculated all of that before, right? Okay, all we just need to do is to start plugging in the values. We're focusing on beta 1. So what, what, what do we get for beta 1 cap? 0.7, right? We're going to put that. Then T, uh, the one we will check from the table. It's 3.182, right? What is the S? You know, the question he, he, he just asked now, the square root of sum of square error divided by M minus 2. Then square root of 0.1, the C11. Okay, the C11 here is going to be 1 over SSS. And at the end of the day, look at what we got. Okay? We actually, you know, when you take a look at this, how do we, Take, can we take a decision 
that will take on hypothesis testing using the confidence interval. Let's take a look at that. You know, this, I, I got 0.7 plus or minus 0.61, all right? If I want to know the lower bound, I'm actually going to do 0 0.7 minus 0 0.610. That's not going to be negative. You know that? That's not going to be negative. Then I'm going to have 0 0.7 to 0 0.61. Uh, it means I'm actually going to have two positive values. Situation where your confidence interval gives two positive values, it means there is no zero in the interval. And when there's no zero in the interval, that confirms the significance of beta one. So, which means right now, using hypothesis testing and using the confidence interval, we actually got the same, it's going to be the same decision. The only thing here is that uh, the confidence interval is very, very wide. Okay, it's very, very wide. Maybe the reason why it's very, very wide is because of the sample, the sample of five. That is too small, right? Okay, so if we want to, you know, what could narrow, the confidence interval is when you increase the sample size. When we increase the sample size, okay, the, the, the standard error, the mean square, the standard error is going to go down. When the standard error goes down, the mean square error goes down. When the mean square error goes down, you're actually going to have a narrow interval. Okay, so take a look at that. Now, the next thing that I want to walk you through now how do we make inferences concerning the linear function of the modal parameters? And we want to focus on the simple linear regression. Okay, you know, we've, we've, we've already conducted inference on beta naught and beta one. But what of if we have a situation where we got the linear combination of the parameters? Okay, so how can we conduct an inference on that? Now, we're talking about simple linear regression, uh, which is specified as this guy here, right? Okay. Now, if that is specified at that guy here, of course, you know, let's say that represents the mean yield of a chemical process for the selling of control process variable S, which could be the mean mileage rating of four cylinder gasoline engines with cylinder volume S. Okay, now let's say we, well, we suppose we wish to make inference about this. We are no longer making inference about beta naught and beta one, but we want to make inference about linear combination of beta naught and beta one. That's what we want to do now. Okay, now if I specify this as parameter, of course, the, the, the corresponding estimator is going to be this. Do you know that with uh, a Silovsky theorem that we did before, okay, we can actually talk about convergence of the theta curve to theta, okay, why, in, of course, uh, theta curve will converge to theta if beta naught curve converges to beta naught and if beta one curve converges to beta one and the entire linear combination, they're actually going to, uh, they're going to experience convergence. Now, you okay, can look at this. Let's take the expectation of both sides. Why are we taking the expectation? Because the theta, the theta cap here is an estimator of the linear combination. We may want to investigate whether that is unbiased. You know, it's going to be unbiased when the expected value of theta cap equal to theta. That's exactly what I'm doing here. Take a look at this guy. Of course. Expected value, of, if expected value of this guy is this guy, is the expected value of this guy is this guy, then the whole of this is now the theta. And that was why I said by Silovsky theorem, the convergence of, of a component will lead to convergence of the system that have the components. That's exactly what I mean. Now, you know, we just talked about the unbiasedness property of the estimator that represents the linear combination, because it's an estimator, we may want to test uh, how consistent it is and how efficient it is. Because of that, we need the variance of the estimator. <laughs> you understand that? 
the variance of estimator is needed in case you want to investigate it, the consistency, okay, not only consistency, uh, efficiency, and not only that, if I want to conduct an inference on an estimator, I need to know the variance of the estimator, and I also need to know, uh, if I know the variance of the estimator, I'll be, uh, I'll be able to know the standard error of the estimator. Now, I need you to take a look at this, uh, you know, to the, if you look at the estimator now, take a look at this as the estimator. Give me one second. If you take a look at this as the estimator, and I, and I, I said, what is it? The variance of theta cap will be the variance of that plus the variance of that plus the two covariance. Did you remember that? That we've done something like that before. And that is going to look like, that is going to look like this. Take a look at that. Because the constant is going to be squared. You have the variance of beta naught, the variance of beta one cap. Then you're going to have two into A naught, A one covariance. Is there anyone who, who need clarification on how we got that? Do you remember variance of X plus Y will be equal to variance of X plus the variance of Y plus two covariance X, Y? Is there any question about this? And you know what? We already know the variance of beta naught cap. We already know the variance of beta one cap. And not only that, we also know the covariance. Okay? So, you know, uh, we, that has been given before. This is this guy, the variance of beta high, the covariance, okay? And of course, the COO is that, the C11 and the CO1 is that you need the CO1 in case we want to talk about the covariance. Please pay attention. Okay? Now, the moment we have this guy now, depending on what the constant is, A0 and A1, it's going to be super easy. Now, take a look at this. Let's say I want to test hypothesis about this guy now. That's a linear combination, right? I want to test hypothesis about linear combination. Okay, this is going to be the non-hypothesis about any of that, any of the alternative. Then how will my test statistic be? Oh, my test statistic, don't forget, you know, using the idea of a, st of, of a standard normal distribution, when I have an estimator, then minus the hypothesized value, then the whole thing here is just going to be the standard deviation of the estimator. And the standard deviation of the estimator is... If you know the variance of the estimator, then the standard deviation of that is going to be square root of that guy, which has already been, and don't forget the variance of beta now, the variance of beta one, the covariance, you know, don't forget all, you know, all of that. And let me just present to you the test statistic. Okay, it's actually this guy. Don't forget, you see as X, you, you see that S, the standard deviation? The square root of sum of square error divided by m minus two. Take a look at that. We've already plugged in the variance of beta now, the variance of beta one and so on like that. Take a look at that. That becomes our test statistic to test an estimate, to test uh, an hypothesized value for the linear combination. Now, what is the rejection region? That is still gonna, you know, it doesn't change. See the rejection region. Whether I want to talk about linear combination, I want, if I want to test parameters, you know, uh, uh, about, I mean, I want to test hypothesis about linear combination of parameters, or I only want to focus on a particular parameter, the rejection region does not change. Now, so take a look at that. And don't forget, they are going to be based on N minus two degree of freedom. Now, this is testing hypothesis about linear combination. Now, how is it different, like, if I want to construct a confidence interval? It's going to be easy because I already, if I already have this guy, okay, and I have this guy, the confidence interval will be easy. Take a look at the confidence interval now. <laughs> you know, the other time, in the test, this was the denominator, right? And Except that you're only going to have the critical value with that. 
Take a look at that. So the whole of that, let me tell you this. Pay attention now. Pay attention. Take a look at this guy. That is the standard error of a theta curve. But if I now include this guy, that becomes margin of error. Does that make sense? There's a difference between the standard error and the margin of error when you multiply the standard error by the quantifier, which is the value you check in the table. It becomes margin of error. But the whole of that with the S is called the standard error of the, of the theta curve. And X itself is a standard deviation where do you get a standard deviation from? The square root of the sum of square error divided by m minus two. Okay, now I think I've given, I've shown you the two now. Now, which means depending on what the values of a naught and a one. I, I think somebody asked a question here. It is working. Oh, it is working okay for me. I, I don't know what the person means. I, I just saw it is working okay for me. Like I said, if you want to talk, oh, okay, okay, you were replying to a student. Okay, now I want to move. Now, do you, if you are talking about the linear combination of parameter that we talk about, whether for confidence interval for hypothesis testing, a very good example of that is prediction interval. There's something that we call prediction interval. Oh, somebody said, what is the difference again between standard error and standard deviation? Okay, that's a good question. Okay, now the person that asked the question, please take notes. I need you to focus now. I want to believe that is changing for you, right? Those of you online, is it changing, right? I need, I need you to comment, yes, if it's changing. I'm, I'm talking about the slide. Is the slide changing for you? If you talk, I can't hear you. That's why I needed to shout with me. Maybe network. Oh, it's changing. Thank you. Okay, now somebody asked about the difference between standard deviation and standard error. Okay, for what we're doing now. Okay, this guy here, S. Uh, give me one second. This guy here. Is a standard deviation. Does that make sense? Which is the square root of sample variance. Okay? But the whole of this guy, the whole of the denominator, the whole of the denominator, okay, is the standard deviation of theta cap that we also call standard error. Okay, now because of my time, I'm actually going to go. Now, one of the examples of a linear combination of parameter is what we call prediction interval. You know, when you use a module, a linear regression module to make a prediction, okay, when you get a single value, that's a point estimate of prediction. And a point estimate of just like you are getting a single value, a single value could be wrong or right. And that is the reason why we also need an interval estimate for prediction. There are two types of prediction. We have individual one. And I mean, I'm talking about two types of prediction interval. We have individual one and we have the mean one. Now, we want to have a confidence interval for the mean value of y when x equal to theta for a particular value, x. When I say for a particular value, okay, now it's different from when I'm, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 okay, take a look at this. This is what, do you see this? A confidence for the mean value of y, which means the prediction interval that I want to talk about here is mean prediction interval because you see the mean. But there's going to be another one that will be for individual. Now, this is, this is what we want to do. If you take a look at this model now, then it's telling you if you compare this, you know, 
we want to use this. That's a linear combination. It means A0 and A1, like A0 equal to 1 here. That is the meaning. If you remember what we did here, you see this guy? Right? You know, we have A0, A1. Okay. If I want to be specific now, talking about prediction interval for the mean values of Y, it, it, it is, this is the formula, which means this guy here, okay, is actually, you know, because I already know beta no cap, I know beta one cap, then S star will be the particular value of X. Like if I want to make a prediction for Y, I need to be given the values of X. And S here, as that you see, still remain the standard deviation, which is going to be the square root of sum of square error divided by a minus. I want to believe you understand this formula now. What of in a situation? We want to predict for particular value y. For particular value y is individual. It's different from the mean. What would be the difference between the two? The difference between the two is just like you are adding one. You are adding this guy into the formula. If you take a look at that, every other thing remains the same. And you know what? When you, if I ask you in exam that you should construct a prediction interval based on it, why? And based on the mean y, the one for the mean y, we have a narrow interval. The one for individual, we have a wider interval. And that is why in statistics, we prefer using the mean one. Does that make sense? I'm going to say that again. If you, if you use this formula now, if everything stays the same for the prediction for, for a particular y, and you use this formula here, For the mean y, if you compare the interval, the one with the mean will be narrower. The one with the individual will be wider. And that is the reason why in statistics we prefer a prediction interval that is based on the average of y. Does that make sense? OK. Now, let me walk you through an example here. Is an example now. You just plug it in, just plug all of that in. Then you have this. Uh, this is a prediction interval based on average of, of the response variable y. Okay, if you follow all of that, why this guy here, why this guy here is a prediction interval based on individual y. But here, uh, my S star uh, that, I, that I'm plugging in is two. But here, uh, here, the S star I'm plugging in is one. And I'm confirming to you, if I put the same thing in all of them, okay, the, the, the one that will make more sense is going to be, is going to be this guy. Why? Because the, the reason why this one has a narrower interval is because the standard error, let me show you, the standard error and the margin of error is smaller. This guy here is smaller than this guy. It's smaller than, uh, give me one second, it's smaller than this guy. You can see one has one plus something, right? The other one does not have. So this one is what we call prediction interval for individual Y. Let me give you this example before I go. There's something that, there's a website called Rate My Professor uh, website. Now, let's say why, let's say we want to look at the relationship between clarity of a professor and quality. If the quality is Y and clarity is X, if I know the clarity of a professor, and I want to predict uh, the quality, now if the if the that interval is talking about 
for professors, not just one, then we're, we're actually going to use, we're actually going to use, we're actually going to use this guy for the confidence interval. Because we can only talk about the mean value of why if more than one person is involved. But let's say you want to talk about me, for me, okay, Professor Kazim, for me now, then the interval is going to be, what you're going to use for the interval, is going to be this guy. And that is why they say it is for the individual, this guy, okay, for individual Why? Does that make sense? Okay, so this is going to be the end of our lecture for the semester on Monday and Wednesday that we're going to meet. It's just going to be revision. Okay, I before I go, I want to appreciate all of you, you know, for...